Okay, at this point, we are, we're going to pivot a little bit, and you've heard both Ashley and, uh, and Ken kind of tease uh, their comments a little bit, but we're really pleased to have a couple of key partners uh, in the Watershed Improvement Program join us today, and uh, both of them have been at, at all of the summits. Um, and I don't know that I've ever told Ashley this, but you know, when you work on something as much as we work on the Watershed Improvement Program, we talk about it all the time. But when you go to a meeting somewhere in Sacramento and somebody else says the words, Sierra Nevada Watershed Improvement Program, you're like, Wait a minute, did she just say that? And I think she's the first person I ever heard kind of in a different setting point to it and talk about it. And it's like, I knew she was paying attention. I really, I knew it. So it was great. So she's been a tremendous partner, not only on the, on the WIP, but on all of the efforts that many of us have been a part of um, in developing policies and strategies and trying to address this problem at a state level. So are you going to go to the podium? Yeah, so um, I'd like to introduce officially now um, Ashley Conrad Seda, who is the Deputy Secretary for Climate Policy at the California Environmental Protection agencies. So they're going to mic her up. Okay. This is a good time to tweet. Hashtag California forest carbon. Hashtag restore the Sierra. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a little bit to it. Yesterday we did a live stream with uh, board member Reyes. Just before we went live, we found out that Smokey Bear was following us on Twitter. So you should all, that's, that's big, right? How he does it, I have no idea. But, you know, and that was all Susanna's doing, I'm sure. So, Ashley, thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks so much. Thanks for having me here. Um, it's the, my fourth uh, summit and the fourth summit. So um, I, I'm glad to have been here from the beginning. Um, as I noted, most of my talking points have already come out one way or another. Um, so I, uh, I'll, I'll say some of what you've already heard. But also what I'd really like to talk about is, um, how what we're talking about can make it further into policy and can make it further onto the ground. Um, because all of us in this room agree on what needs to happen. We all agree on the condition of the forests. Um, we all agree that not enough is being done. And we all agree that we need more. So um, really, the next steps is how we get this done and how we bring science into action um, for legislators, for people living in systems that are part of the forest and outside of the forest, and uh, for, for kind of the global public as well. And I mention the global public because California is hosting a Global Climate Action Summit in September, and forest work is going to be a big part of what we talk about at that summit. Um, so, you know, I'll say I, I sit in sort of an odd place to be talking about forests as much as I do. I'm at the California Environmental Protection Agency, and I work on climate policy, and obviously forests are a big part of climate policy, but my building is home to boards and departments that regulate air and water and pesticides and toxics, and um, they don't necessarily think about larger ecosystems and ecological landscapes. So I've come in to sort of take engineers' words and make sure they understand that we can't really use engineering to get our way out of the system. We have to think about larger natural landscapes and, um, and think about our actions as not regulatory widgets, but larger views of how we take a bunch of different policies and fit them all together so we can end up with a landscape level uh, improvement for all of us in California and again worldwide. Um, so we're seeing, you know, climate change is really the existential crisis for all of our generations and for many generations to come. Um, I know I'm motivated to go to work, not because I'm going to see progress tomorrow, but because hopefully we'll see progress in 10 years, 20 years, 50 or 100 years. Um, when I had my first child four years ago, my boss told me that we needed to stop looking at 2030 or 2050 goals, but go to 2100 or 2200 goals, because I'm, I now have a next generation to be paying attention to. So um, I think that's right. It's the, this massive crisis. We're seeing temperatures rising at an unprecedented rate, um, stronger storms, rising sea levels, mass displacement of people worldwide. This is a massive crisis. And we're seeing everything that we've talked about in our forests as well. So really big impacts. Um, on the positive side, I will move away from doom and gloom. We're also seeing innovation. So we're seeing people work together in subsets that we haven't seen before. We're seeing business come to the table to be part of the solution. We're seeing jurisdictional boundaries break down because it doesn't matter. And we're seeing all this innovation uh, bring us opportunities to make a difference. Some things will fail, some things will work. But at least we're seeing innovation and we're seeing new efforts being tried on the ground. So I will say that that's a really positive outcome to the crisis in front of us right now. Um, California, you know, we're, we're a 
we have the most ambitious subnational goal for climate change in the world. We are trying to reduce our emissions to help in this climate problem to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. Um, no one else in the world has that much ambition. Um, as a nation, we've moved away from our commitment to, uh, to actually do something in a climate crisis, but California has doubled down and said, we're, we're gonna go further and we're gonna host a big summit and we're gonna try to get other people to join us too. So um, we're taking a lot of steps, and as noted earlier, a lot of those steps are in the built environment. We're doing high-speed rail, mass transit, we're looking at a lot of investments, housing, things like that, that help people in our urban areas reduce their emissions. We aren't doing as much in the natural environment, and I think we, we have an opportunity, all of us in this room and, and others out in the world, to ask for that, to ask for a bigger investment in the natural environment, because there's an opportunity right now. There's financial resources, there's political will, there's an understanding that this is really bad. We don't want to see those fires over the next 10 years. We want to try to do something. So, so we are at a very good moment, and I think of all of these four summits, we're at a really terrible moment, because we've seen the worst fire season ever, but we're, we're at a very good moment because we have opportunity in front of us. And as I mentioned earlier, we need to figure out how to communicate this. So um, the solution, you know, we've talked about prescribed fire and we've talked about, uh, we've talked about cutting timber. There's also bioenergy. There's also spending on our water infrastructure as though the trees are part of that infrastructure. So potentially asking our water users to pay a little bit more to protect forests upstream. Um, we can also get recreational folks involved to understand how they can be a part of the solution. We need citizen scientist projects as well. So we have a lot of different tools in the toolbox and we, we kind of need to throw all of them out there at this point. And um, from a political will perspective or a state agency perspective, uh, we're doing a lot. So from the state agency perspective, as I mentioned earlier, we're working on a natural and working lands implementation plan. Shelby Livingston, who's kind of on the far side of the room, is leading that effort for us. She lives in Colfax. She sees firsthand what's happening in the forests, and she really cares about the outcome. So we have a really great leader at the Air Resources Board making sure that that plan actually tells us how to do regional action and, um, and see change on the ground. Um, we are working, well, you'll see a forest carbon plan soon, as Kaylee E. mentioned. And in that plan, we call out regional frameworks like the Watershed Improvement Program as the solution for getting something on the ground. So we see regional frameworks as the only way to move ahead. There's no silver bullet, especially in the forests. You have 33 million acres, a ton of heterogeneity, lots of different systems, varying amounts of dying trees within those systems. You need regional frameworks, trusted relationships to actually move forward and make a big difference. Um, we are also working globally. So we're working with uh, folks who live in Amazon forests and boreal forests to understand their best practices and hope that we can bring some of the best practices here. Um, we're, we're sort of outdated in the way we collect data from the forests. And there are actually states in Brazil that do a better job of actually follow, using remote sensing data and looking at change in the forests on a daily basis. And though we don't necessarily need daily satellite data, forests are slow to change, we do need an opportunity to, to actually do more enforcement and respond to illegal changes in the forest a little bit faster. So we're learning from our partners worldwide on how to look at illegal logging and illegal poaching um, in California's forests as well. Um, and then um, finally, I think we're trying to, through you know, an opening from the governor in the state of the state this year to set up a, a forest task force, um, we're trying to uh, move forward without having to revisit discussions on what's wrong with the forest, but actually jump right to regional action. So Ken and Kaylee and I have been working together on a plan to actually stand up these regional efforts, support them with more financial resources and more political will so that you can go out and take action on the landscape a little bit faster. And that's, that's still a work in progress, so um, please don't, don't hold us to anything just yet. We're working on it, and um, we'll hopefully have some results for you pretty soon. Um, so partnerships and funding programs are in place within the Watershed Improvement Program, and as you saw from Ellie's presentation, there's work getting done on the ground. Um, we have another, uh, a, another big effort in the Rim Fire that's supported by federal funding. We have the North Coast Resource Partnership. There's a lot of partnerships. There's the Tuolumne River Trust that's doing some good work too. But there's resource, resource partnerships all over the state that should be supported. Um, and that's where I'll come to the final piece, which is the funding piece. And I think, you know, from the administration or sort of 
the executive branch of the administration, I do everything I can in talking to the governor's office and talking to my allies and colleagues across state government to get as much money as we can into these landscapes and to make sure it's in the annual budget and to make sure that everyone understands why this is important. That it's not just about trees, but it's about water, recreation, jobs, economies, landscapes, wildlife. I mean, there's too many things at risk if we lose the forests. And so I try to make all of those connections personally to the people who are actually going to ink the budget at the end of the day. Try to get them out to the forest, not just to these rooms, but go out and see what it looks like on the ground. Um, and in doing so, we've managed to keep forest funding in the annual budget from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. But it shouldn't be an annual fight. This needs to be something that is funded by necessity out of a number of sources, not just the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, but it needs to be coming from a lot of other areas. And that's where you all come in. You have to communicate to your legislators at the state government, which is where the money is coming from right now, that they need to fund more from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, from some of our water funds, from recreational funds, from the license plate fund, from every special fund. More of it needs to be going into these 33 million acres. Um, and, and you need to communicate this mass threat that we've heard that too much is at stake. So, uh, so I think I will say that I try every day to communicate this to the people I work with, to my boss and to the governor's office, and I need help. Um, and so everyone on the dais helps with that. But all of you, I think, you know, the messages we're hearing today and the messages that, um, that we hear annually and, and that we read about, those are those things that we just need to bring up more often. Um, not in a doomsday scenario, but in almost an opportunistic scenario. There's opportunity for innovation and there's opportunity for all of us to get engaged. Um, so I'll just say, you know, thanks to the Watershed Improvement program for really being a proving ground for how these on-the-ground partnerships work. Um, and now it's our turn to go off and, and really talk about how important this is and bring it into the public eye. So thanks so much for having me here today. And um, my door is always open. I'm a part of the Brown administration, so I won't be around forever. But um, I'm working really, really hard in the next year uh, to make sure that the things that we're putting in place have legs um, once I have to shuffle off. Um, and, I, and just a plug for the Global Climate Action Summit, if you do have an interest in uh, global forests and you do have an interest in participating in some of the planning we're doing around um, getting people who are coming to California from all over the world out to the forests, um, please let me know. Uh, you can find my contact info. My last name is weird and rare. And so if you Google me, you'll find me very quickly. And um, that's it. So thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of the, the meeting. Thanks. Yeah. Either way, what do you want to do? Yeah, maybe we do mine and we'll see if we can team up questions. Okay. All right. When, when the guy wearing all the stars tells you what's going to do, that's kind of what we do. So um, uh, <laughs> I did. Um, so next up is uh, another uh, a great partner for, uh, as a part of the Watershed Improvement Program, obviously um, someone who's got a busy job, a difficult job, a challenging job. So we always appreciate his willingness to spend time with us here but not just here, but regularly engaging with us and trying to address these very complex issues we face in the Sierra Nevada. So um, once again, thank you for being here, Chief. And so uh, Director of CAL FIRE, Chief Ken Pimlock. Thanks, Jim. And, and absolutely. But also, he never really gives you a choice. He says you're going to be there, you're going to be there. But that's good. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. The, the disadvantage of going uh, last is everybody's pretty much said everything that you were going to say. But the... Uh, uh, but that's good, and the advantage of that is you get a chance to, going last, really wrap this up uh, into uh, sort of where are we going, or you know, my thoughts on where we're going from here. And everybody's hit the, the nail on the head. We uh, just came off of 2017, you know, worst fire season for California, I can tell you. Having lived it, and even before the October fire siege, we were so far ahead in terms of fires and acres uh, than where we've been. Um, the fatigue was already there before the disasters themselves hit. Um, for California, you know, we've, the, the state invested decades ago uh, in uh, a protection system for, for private lands, 31 million acres of watershed lands around the state. And, uh, you know, we've benefited from the ability to uh, access funds that provide direct fire suppression and not uh, impact other programmatic sources. But even for California, the state, has spent to date over $700 million in the 2017 uh, fire season uh, 
budget year beginning July 1st. And uh, we've budgeted, because uh, our fire season will start up again and, and will transcend the, um, the fiscal year, which ends June 30th, you know, we've budgeted almost $900 million this year uh, in uh, emergency fund expenditures above and beyond the base budget. Uh, that's double uh, where we've ever been at at a peak fire season, even some of our most destructive seasons back in uh, 03 and 2007. So clearly we're seeing and feeling the change. And as Secretary Laird said, we, we've had incredible support to get resources and expand the budgeted length of fire season, both on the, the ramp up in the spring and the, the ramp down in the fall and uh, maintaining those for longer periods of time. Uh, we're going to have to continue to keep that pace because, one, we're not going to change what's going on out in our forests and our watersheds overnight. Uh, two, again, as I said, 40 million people, public expectation. Uh, there are a lot of things driving where these costs are at when we're dealing with state and private lands. And I'm glad the point was brought up also about the kinds of watershed lands we're talking about. Again, people think when they see fires, forest fires, and they see we're talking today about engaging and managing our forests. But you take a fire like the Thomas fire, largest fire in the state's history, 281,000 acres, um, over $150 million in cost. But very little of that was forest. You know, maybe the big cone Douglas fir and the drainages and some areas in riparian, but most of that was chaparral, you know, mixed chaparral, that southern central coast chaparral, uh, and urban interface. And when that fire came off uh, those very steep watershed lands on the Los Padres and into cities, urban areas, and you know, protecting communities like Santa Barbara, Montecito, Carpinteria, very expensive. And over 2,000 fire engines were committed to that fire. Over 500 fire engines on one day, uh, on one, we call almost Black Saturday, tr protecting the communities um, of Santa Barbara. Uh, and uh, they did an amazing job. But those things come at huge costs. And so a big part of the $700 million to date so far is engaging in this urban interface firefight. And so there's lots of other things we have to talk about in that arena that aren't directly involved in necessarily some of the forest management, forest policy things we're talking about. But it all rolls up into one you know, statewide fire fuels forest management um, discussion. So and Jim pointed it out, and it's clear, you know, we, looking at $200 million this year in the budget, it's a lot of money. But when you look at the problem and the challenge we have, it's a drop in the bucket for what we have to do. And the kinds of work that we have to do out there is not always cost efficient. I mean, it's expensive to work in the woods. All of this is expensive. And uh, Woody talked about what it takes to go in and plan a, a prescribed burn, even in Sequoia or Yosemite National Park, uh, where this is much more routine than other places. It takes prep work. It takes control lines. It takes engaging with uh, you know, our air districts. It takes all that. And it takes public um, engagement and socializing this as uh, a, a process that's accepted. Um, that takes time, effort, money, and um, a lot uh, of fortitude. So to spread this, to engage the, the, the funding that we're, we're being allocated, how do we leverage that? How do we leverage our efforts? Again, as Jim talked about, I, I talk about spreading it like peanut butter across the state. Well, that, historically, I can tell you in CAL FIRE's programs, that's often what we've done. Limited amount of money, we've ju we just put in a grant program and landowners, folks, apply. We go down a list, what are the most qualified applicants until we run out of money. We give the money out, whether it's in the north, the south, the coast, or the Sierra. Money's gone, we move on. And folks are doing great work out there with these small projects, but we never really move the needle forward in getting something done. And uh, you've heard the challenges today. It's, it's the ability to have capacity to get work done. It's the ability to put infrastructure back. And it's the full suite of, of infrastructure, as Ashley said. It's, it's the wood processing facilities, of obviously logs and lumber, but it's biomass facilities. It's uh, the secondary wood products. All of those things that uh, go into utilizing all of the material. Well, there, no one's going to invest if there isn't a commitment uh, to have a long-term supply, both from public and private land. Well, if we're going to be investing these monies statewide and continue to just put it around the state, we'll never be able to leverage enough uh, in one place and leverage partnerships to bring, again, all the funding sources that Ashley talked about together uh, to get one larger project. Um, and so the efforts really need to be 
focusing from a statewide perspective. And I can tell you what we're looking at as we work towards implementing these next two rounds of, uh, of CCI money or greenhouse gas reduction funds. It's, it's stepping back and taking a broader look at the entire state, particularly the central, all of the Sierras, but particularly the central and southern Sierra, and how can we strategically look at good projects. And, and as Jim talked about, where there's hundreds of millions of project requests have come in. Uh, so how do we strategically look at those that are good, solid projects, but that are coordinated and leveraged and give us concentration in areas to really make a difference so that we can start seeing things on the ground? Making changes in forests, as you heard, take decades. Uh, you know, it, but as the public, we have a microwave mentality. We want to see things happen right now. Well, we're not going to change the flavor of the forest overnight, but we can start doing work overnight so that people see it and so that people know that something's getting done, that these monies are being invested in something real. Folks then will start to engage and invest in the momentum that will go. Uh, I've been doing this for 30 years. Never have I seen the level of interest right now. And yes, Horrible disasters last year, but even prior to the fire season uh, this last year, the momentum was already starting to gel in terms of a desire and an interest and an engage in this, this arena. Uh, I, having spent a lot of time with the governor uh, last year, particularly last fall, uh, he gets it. And uh, as Ashley said, for him to put that in the front part of his state of the state, to literally talk about forest management, I mean, he lived it with us last fall. And to talk about it the way he did and invest and engage in, you know, a, a task force going forward that will live beyond this administration, that will be embedded not to reinvent wheels, but to leverage everything we're talking about today and be a, a, a body that will continue to support all these efforts going on on the ground. Um, that's um, groundbreaking. And we have some opportunities right now to, to grab hold of that and, and build it and make it to what we want to do and invest in that. And... Um, we just need to continue to focus on the coordination. And the watershed improvement program is, quite frankly, the model. Uh, there are lots of efforts going on around the state, lots of good efforts. Certainly for the Sierra, uh, the watershed improvement program um, is leading the way in this. And uh, really, I'm challenging the Sierra Nevada Conservancy because you're so engaged in so many issues across boundaries uh, in the Sierras. You know, challenge you to, to bring folks together to talk about within this watershed improvement program, how do we consolidate funding? How do we prioritize? How do we start looking at that um, on a watershed level uh, and help us um, determine how we're going to allocate uh, funds and how do we get that biggest bang from the buck? We need uh, this group to help us get that for, for the Sierras. And so, uh, I think we can accomplish a lot. Um, there's energy in this room where literally we're all saying the same things. And so uh, the challenge for us over the next several months uh, is to uh, put together that spending plan and bring some recommendations forward to the state. And like I said, as Ashley said and others, we're listening and we want to figure out how to do that. So with that, thank you. And I think we'll turn it over to questions. Thank you, Chief. We accept your challenge, so just so you know, we're, we're ready. <laughs> so, um, okay, so where did Ashley go? Oh, oh there. Okay. <laughs> I thought you, thought you left. I thought, no, you can't leave. Um, so we've got some time again up in the dais. Questions, comments to to either uh, Chief Pimlot or Ashley? Supervisor Hanfield. Look, I find this whole conversation we've had today very enlightening. Uh, but it's all talk, okay? That's what we've been doing for years. It's time to roll up the sleeves and get something done. Uh, my hat's off to, to Ken, uh, the chief, and, and what he's been doing. But there's players in the state government that I don't think are playing in the game. Uh, the Air Resources Board has got to be out there so we can put the fire burns on the, on the forest. And by the way, Craig, thank you for your comments. Uh, but I think one of the things we've got to put in the game is wherever it's capable of burning, we can put those therapeutic burns in. We've got to repeat that every six to ten years, no more than ten. I think, and we got to have that in the program. And then we got to get the rest of our forest. Barney, I want to pick on you, okay? <laughs> Barney, you know this. You know it's coming. You can't get get free from me. But <laughs> but the, the point is, you keep talking about you got 9 million acres that you need to treat. You keep talking about 500,000 acres a year that you need to treat. 
I'm going to argue that that's an 18-year plan. I think that's too long. I think we need to get to a plan where we're treating, because of the including the fire therapeutic fire, where it's more often than that. We're going to continue to perpetuate our problem until we get ourselves moving forward to do this. It's going to go a long time, but we need to get a plan to get where we need to be on an equilibrium basis to deal with our problem. And we're not doing it. We need to stop talking. We need to roll up sleeves and get moving. We need to get the players in the game that need to play in the game. <clears throat> Air Resources Board needs to get in the game and support <clears throat> the, the therapeutic underburns. They need to support more biomass, at least for now. As the, I know they don't like it, but they need to support it until we get to the stream. They, they helped us get five years on these plants, but they won't last five years because they've got to make any investment in the plant. The plant's going to shut down because it can't get a return on it. Okay, <clears throat> uh, we've got to develop these these alternative programs. These can be, if we were able to do this, there'd be more God blessed biomass than we could possibly deal with, even with with open field burning biomass and 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 alternative uh, methods. Uh, and RCRC's in the game. They're they're trying to develop some of these alternative biomass things. We've got some market for timber in this state. We import seventy percent of the wood products. <clears throat> that that uh, we use in this state, and in the United States is is behind China, but we're the number two importer in, in the country. I mean, there are markets for some of this stuff that we need to get off our landscape, and there's a lot more work to do than we're going to get done in anybody's lifetime in this room. Let's get with it. Is my point, and Chief, I appreciate that you're all in, and you have been, and your team's been all in on both sides of the game. And uh, I want to say thanks. Gonna let Barney off easy. Okay. I know. You want to say anything? So, um, yeah, we, we do need to drastically increase the number of acres that we treat. For instance, this year we're looking at trying to prescribe burn 210,000 and, and then looking at trying to increase. So, uh, no, uh, I'll have to disagree. Uh, I can't afford or we can't afford a 20-year plan. So it's 210 burning this year. We're going to ask our folks to burn 300,000 next year, and then we're going to e continue to increase it. So, no, I'm not looking at 20 years. I'm looking at how do we uh, maybe within the next five to seven years, we'd be able to treat 500,000, which includes mechanical and prescribed burning. Okay. Anything else up from the? Oh. Yeah, I guess I'll push back a little bit too. I mean, just in terms of being all talk, we did get seventy million dollars for Tuolumne County through our um, natural resource of resiliency, uh, natural re resiliency disaster program, and um, you know, and so that's that works out to fifteen hundred dollars per resident in Tuolumne County, which is more than any grant program in the state at this point. So, you know, remember that as much as we're talking, we are doing a lot, and um, and I think that there has to be talk because not enough people know necessarily how big the problem is. So uh, I think we do need to take some recognition for the work that we are getting on the ground, the money we are getting on the ground, the progress we've made with the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, um, and acknowledge that, of course, there's more work to do. But if we don't keep talking, people won't understand how big the problem is. Yes, Steve. So I just want to say that um, um, the WIP, the Watershed Improvement Program, is a incredibly creative and innovative program. and. The partnership with the Forest Service and them stepping up the way they did to to do to do this work, on um, the Tahoe really went out there and and did a really good job. And to me, what it comes down to is learning how to ask the right questions and understand what kind of answers we need. And I think that's what these four years have given us. And now the going forward, it'll be how to replicate it across the Sierra, how to export it to our partners, and um, that's going to be a big challenge, but I think we're up for it. So, thank you. Woody, did you have something? Yeah. I, um, I just, I really appreciate the uh, comment that Ashley made about talking. Uh, the, the common thread that I've heard through a lot of these presentations today goes back to the importance of communicating with the public about both the urgency uh, and how real that is uh, but also that we have solutions. We've we've um, we've tried things and have applied things that have produced results that have been good, and that those are attainable. Um, 
and we had the tools to do it, uh, do we have the will behind it to carry it out, and the public will, and can we mobilize the investment that's necessary to carry it out? And those are still big questions for me. How, I'm curious to hear from the two of you what your thoughts are about what a, a good integrated communication plan uh, that creates this kind of provocative message that gets the public you know, fully, fully involved and engaged such that it results in investments that help us carry this out. Because this is, I agree, this is at a scale that is very different from what we've been talking about. No, it's, uh, you're spot on, Woody. And it, the communications part is a challenge. Obviously, most of the people that vote and uh, that influence these decisions, uh, many have never set foot in a forest or never get to a wildland. Or their experience is with a wildland fire that uh, obviously is a devastating and, and catastrophic event for them. And so they're always thinking, absolutely, it's, we're going to put these fires out and it's a, it's a disaster. Uh, when it comes time to figure out how to invest on the front end, uh, we don't have that interest. Uh, there's all these other issues that come up and trying to educate public. And, and, and I will, one of the examples of a communication strategy, and it's Craig Thomas has led this uh, in those difficult airsheds we talked about that you're familiar with and, and Stephen in, in the southern half of the valley. And that's engaging with what we would, we would consider to be non-traditional communities, the public health community. Um, because and Craig can talk best to this, but when we sit down <laughs> with the physician groups, the, the doctors and the hospitals, and we talk about what happens on a bad fire day or on a rim fire versus what happens on a prescribed fire and what the difference in emissions are, and we articulate that, then they, can, they look at that and they fully understand what the difference in health impacts are. They get on board, and I know that many of the physicians in that area are champions of this now. And so if we can get to these non-traditional, again, what we consider non-traditional partners, but people who have a loud voice who people listen to and start to and respect and start to turn that decision and discussion but we can never stop we have to keep the dialogue going but it does but I, I do agree with Randy we have to have action and we can't wait for the perfect plan and if there's anything it's we do know it's not perfect and Stephen was perfect at saying hey we've never been through this before at this scale so we don't really know what the answers are but we know enough to know to try, and it doesn't mean doing a 10-acre plot to do an experiment. It means we need to start working on thousands of acres, putting some treatments out there, see if it works. And we can always change down the road, but every day that we wait, we have nothing to communicate to anybody what we're doing. And at the end of the day, people want action. They, they are tired of us talking. They want to see something. We've got to do something so we have something to talk about. And so I think that you're going to hear more of that from us going down the road as we engage uh, with the governor and the administration on this task force. It's absolutely looking to the future and research all of that. But at the same time, it's leveraging what do we, can we do right now with groups like this that know what to do, just get you the funding, get you the support, get you the leverage to get real work done. Then we can start talking about it. But until we can show people... This is what we mean. It, it is just talk. So that's my thought. Yeah, I mean, as you were asking the question, I thought, I wish we had the, the answer of the perfect communication yeah. um, strategy to do this. But I mean, I do think that there's, there's got to be a way to help people understand everything they get from the forests. And I, I think probably we need way smarter communicators than I am um, to try to figure out that campaign. Um, and you just look at successful campaigns for the forest in the past, and Smokey the Bear is uh, ubiquitous. But so what's the next ubiquitous thing that will help people understand the importance of their forests? I guess I just can't resist a comment on that. Having spent um, in my previous life 10 years uh, running the CalFed Bay Delta program and working with RCRC and others trying to convince the world that uh, watershed management in the Sierras made a difference to the public who just they turn their tap on and water comes out. We tried campaigns for a decade and nothing worked. Um, so I guess count me among the skeptics that com convincing the public, the average citizen on the coast, that protecting Sierra trees matters. It needs to be done, but nobody should be under any illusion <coughs> that it's going to happen overnight or in the time scale that's necessary to attack the problem. I think the real audience is ledge staff and members of the legislature and stakeholder groups here who do know better and should be embarrassed that... Uh, Prop 68 has $30 million out of $4 billion going to the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, less than 1%. Uh, 
Um, that's not because a homeowner in LA doesn't get it. That's because the legislator, legislative staff don't get it. Or because of term limits or because they can't think beyond their boundaries or because they don't have the votes or whatever. But you know, the real action is with folks, not so much in this group, this group gets it, but with that next level of sophisticated folks that are right over there in the Capitol. Um, so that's where, in my mind, education needs to happen, is to, is to educate them as to what's at stake, that the governor's AB 32 targets are at risk, you know, in, in terms that they understand at, uh, public health, et cetera, in their communities. So anyway, just a plug for, yes, the public's important, but I think given the level of urgency, it's more important to connect with people you folks know in the Capitol. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Board members, anybody from the SNC board? Mr. President? Uh, as a low innkeeper, Um, I actually commented on the whole notion of engaging the ratepayers down the stream to encourage them to provide resources to face the forest and watershed health. Uh, last year, the Conservancy held a forum here in Sacramento to discuss just that. Um, we got a lot of pushback from Aqua with regards to how to how to carve off a penny or two for the upper watersheds. So how do we approach that in a way that's uh, both feasible and will get action to provide those funds that we need? And secondly, you talk about messaging and communication, and Jim pointed out that Smokey the Bear is now following us. Maybe uh, we can get the singe guy uh, to change his message to not suppress fires, but to engage the public in a way that, that uh, will change the public's mind about how we introduce fire to the landscape. All I know is I put a drift torch and smoke a beer in the hand once and went out. I got in big trouble. So I'm just going to stop. Yeah. Oh, okay. As well. Yeah, thank you. If you remember about three or four years ago, we went and done that uh, uh, legislative day in Sacramento here. We went to probably six or eight offices I did with my little group of together. And every one of them I went into, the first thing I asked them was, what do they know about the Sierra National Forest? And over three-quarter of them, and none of them, what the worst part of it was, they had their age that was talking to us instead of themselves. Almost three-quarters of them didn't even know what the Sierra National Forest was. And I said, have you ever been to them? They just kind of shook their head. So, it, like uh, Patrick said, if we can't educate our legislators, we'll never, ever get the public educated. And, and what Randy said about control burns, uh, I managed a, a big cattle ranch in North Fork for years, and we had to burn every three to five years 1,200 acres just to keep it down. If you go much longer than that, and the gentleman talking about Chaparral over here, he's 100% right, because that's the first thing that comes back. Okay, any other board member comments? Okay, anybody from the public comment? John? Thank you. Uh, John Mills here on behalf of some water agencies. Uh, <laughs> Patrick and I went down this road together in CalFed and both ended up falling into the canyon, so uh, I'm happy to see he's up in, up in our mountains now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and he can look down and, and see where the water goes, and he can see where the customers are. The thing people have to understand briefly about this, before I pose a question to both of you, is, is there are, we have huge opportunity costs here that are not being captured either in the dialogue with the legislature or the dialogue with the public and the agencies. The first opportunity cost uh, is we have suppression costs in human life and in money uh, that are not being captured in the discussion. And so when we sit down and talk to folks about investing in the watersheds, all of that money we're spending on suppression, and some of it will always be there because this is a Mediterranean climate and I don't care what we do in the forest and the chaparral, we're gonna have wildfires, everyone knows that. And I did spend six years working my way through college wearing one of Barney's uniforms chasing fires around the Sierra, so I have some experience in it. 
Uh, and I was highly qualified on McLeod, Barney. So if you if you ever want to, you're going to see me in action with McLeod. Uh, We're still taking volunteers. I got volunteer forms back in my back, so just let me know. You know, excuse me if I'm not the first in line. Uh, <laughs> I'm leaving that to the younger guys. But what I want to point out is, first we have to capture the concept of opportunity cost in human lives, because every one of these guys in a uniform runs towards the fires. And I've known some of those guys. Excuse me. Anyway, back to the other non-emotional issues. I <coughs> two family members lost doing this. But when it comes to the other issue, the other issue is what do we do in investing in the forest when we try to engage the folks downstream and say it's worth your money? Uh, it's a long way from here to San Diego, but it's the same watershed and they have a hard time connecting those dots. We've had this discussion in Aqua. We've tried to connect the dots. It's not like New York State where somebody's really close to the water. <laughs> And so when we have to make this discussion, you've got to convince water agencies who, quite frankly, Steve Moore knows at the state board, we're doing water conservation programs that are chasing drops of water with $100 bills at the end user. And that is an opportunity cost as well, because we're trying to squeeze down the urban water use efficiency to a point that is becoming increasingly costly in the value of how we measure water in California, which is by the acre foot, not by, not by <coughs> millions of gallons, acre feet, which is about 326,000 gallons of water. So there's an opportunity cost that we need to capture is where could we make that investment better? Could we make the investment better by requiring one more water use efficiency measure? I mean, my gosh, we now have efficiency measures, measures for people with outdoor landscaping. And if you don't do it a certain way, uh, we may see regulations that under Article 10, Section 2 of the California Constitution, that's considered waste and unreasonable use. Now, that's serious because with waste and unreasonable use, you get your water right taken away. Now, if, if somebody hosing off their driveway is wasting water, and it may be 20, 30 gallons, whatever the amount is, then arguably I say let's step back, let's take a realistic look at federal preemption versus state preemption of the law. And let's look at a drop of water. And this is the story I tell a lot of people. I'm a drop of water coming off the Pacific. I don't know where I'm going. Right now I'm free, I don't belong to anybody. But I'm running towards the Sierra Nevadas and God forbid, I've now hit a mountain range and my drop is down and I've now become Steve Moore's water. It's, it's the water of the state of California. It's not federal water, it's state water. And then the argument I would pose is how we look at the management of the forest is if in California, if it's wasteful for one, in, one individual to spend 20 or 30 gallons of water washing down a driveway, what is the test for waste and unreasonable use and how the ET ratio and the density of the conifer stands in the Sierra Nevada's waste water? Because that's what it is. And so if we begin to look at water use in our headwaters and in our forests in a different economic direction we have in the past, <coughs> it'll become obviously clear. I agree, talking to the public is great. That's a great way to spend your life. You talk to the public and they listen to you, but it's like, just when you think you're really getting somewhere, it, the old Will Rogers story comes back to me, is just when you think you're really important, try ordering somebody else's dog around. And, th and that's where we are with the public on this, is they listen to us, but they go, yeah, you know, that's not for me. So I think we're much better off with the legislative staff. We, we will have a new administration coming in, and I think we need to hit the ground running, because I'm with Barney on this. We don't need a 20-year plan right now. We gotta get through next year and the year after that. But we begin to make the change with the legislature. And we've got Dave Egerton here from Aqua. He's the chair of our Headwaters Committee. And Dave and I have worked together on that for years, so I don't want to step on his toes, but he is probably, and he also, by the way, Dave is the chair of our Federal Affairs Committee at Aqua, so he's the one who gets to go back and tell the federal government what they need to do, uh, and, and they hang on his every word, I can tell you. You can tell by how much money we're getting. But anyway, that's my pitch on this is, when you folks look at this and say, where do we need to get the money? First thing is, you need an honest set of books. 
we have to look at opportunity costs. We have to look at externalized costs for other resources that are being internalized in how we look at fire control. We have to have honest books. We have to have opportunity costs recognized. We have to have human life included into that formula. And then finally, we've got to have accountability in how that water is managed in the forest because it is managed in the forest in the first place when it hits the ground. There's been a lot of research done by Sierra Nevada uh, Research Institute about what happens on that water when it hits the ground. I think we have compelling evidence now that we can do a lot better with fuel thinning. The burning objectives Barney's described are wonderful, but we've got to do it in a, in a faster pace, a broader scale. And, and I just urge you, when you think about, we need to get people to invest in this. First, you need to start with an honest set of books, and then you can get people to invest. What you've got right now is more of a Ponzi scheme than it is a real way to invest. You've got to, you've got to make it honest. So how can you do that? So I know you're, you, you've got a short timetable here on the Brown administration, but I hope the baton can be passed with some, some of this information in there as well, because it's been a long time coming. Thank you. Okay, thanks, John. Others over here, a couple over on this side, David, and then there, and then back to David Edelson. Okay. Is he? You guys decide. <laughs> Hi, Curtis Howling with Ascent Environmental. Uh, Ellie mentioned earlier at the Tahoe National Forest the approach of uh, front loading, environmental review, front loading planning, front loading permitting to try to get more projects shovel ready. And so I'm interested in how that subject has been, been discussed in the implementation planning uh, as it relates to, to you know, how can we make CEQA and NEPA compliance, California Environmental Quality Act, National Environmental Policy Act, our friend in setting up the projects and programs in maybe getting better community <coughs> acceptance and also in um, streamlining the permitting process. No, very good question, and it's, it cuts right at the core of what one of the most significant challenges are, is we are actually starting to bump up against, from the state side, CEQA-ready projects. That's now becoming one of the limiting factors uh, to getting the work done. It's, it's certainly the, in places, availability of burn days and other things, but just literally, if we're increasing the pace and scale, it's just not putting people out on the ground doing the work. It's getting the, the projects ready. Um, we've been working for almost 10 years now to get the Vegetation Treatment Program Environmental Impact Report uh, for the state done. And this will take the, the old chaparral management program that was very focused uh, on uh, you know, burning chaparral to broaden this out statewide so we can start working in understory burning and doing other work. The Board of Forestry has taken this on, uh, and it's very close uh, to finishing up their public process and going. But that's going to be key to be for us to be able to increase the pace and scale, again, to meet the sequel requirements, but doing it in a programmatic fashion where we've got very much the same kind of project application going uh, across the state. The CEQA NEPA uh, transition is also a critical piece. We've got a lot of projects where we're going cross-boundary. We're using more and more of the Good Neighbor Authority to be able to access each other's lands. Uh, right up here on Highway 50, the Fire Adapted 50 project, where the <clears throat> Sierra Pacific Industries, Sierra Na or the El Dorado National Forest, Cal Fire, El Dorado RCD, the county, many others have come together and are plugging money and projects in to get work done. But obviously, some of the areas we're bumping up against our ability to get, uh, you know, the, the, the pace and scale of the environmental review to stay ahead of some of that. So, so absolutely. Izzy. Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, Izzy Martin from the Sierra Fund. Um, what, what a great day. Thank you so much for, for giving us all this opportunity to, to think together. Um, I think one of my favorite moments of today was when Supervisor Hanvelt used the word therapeutic fire. Good work. I like that word. I've not heard it before. Lucy and me were commenting on it. I think that we, as we talk about these large ideas, how do we get anything done that's really specific? Sierra Fund is only beginning to really work in the forest as, as, because, of course, uh, you know, all the trees were cut down as part of mining. We are really uh, very confounded up there. There's a bill that's been introduced in the legislature I just want to bring your attention to. It's uh, Hannah Beth Jackson's bill, SB 1260. It's called the Fire Protection, uh, Prevention and Protection um, uh, Act, and it's about prescribed burns. And it really speaks to the issue of giving insurance coverage to somebody that meets very clear criteria. They, they've set up to do a, a prescribed burn. They've done everything right. They filled out the permit. They're doing the prescribed burn, and then a meteor hits. 
whoa, their insurance is going to... There's no, there's no ability to, to insure a prescribed fire because there's so many uh, concerns about the, 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 the lightning striking or you know, anything might happen, the wind, the wind shifting, uh, and, uh, somebody, uh, something happening that wasn't expected. This bill says if you meet all of those prescribed fire uh, conditions, if you're using best management practices, et cetera, that you would get insurance coverage. I think that's, I just wanted to raise that one issue because it's, it's an example of the many, many different sort of policy pieces that need to be in place. Where I live in Nevada County, we have people who have houses that can't get, that were in escrow and who now can't get insurance. We have a lot of, this is another, this really affects disadvantaged communities where I live in what we call, I think I heard this first at, the water, at this watershed improvement program a couple of years ago, the term of a forest ghetto where people are living out in some place with, you know, they can't get fire insurance. They might even be a renter. Um, there's the, the ability to, to the, this, this fire problem affects low-income people even much more dramatically than it does wealthy people. And it, it's, it's the kind of issue that, that, so there's the prescribed fire insurance piece and there's these other pieces. They think that it's impossible to solve this problem without every single unit of the state of California, that means the Department of Insurance, Department of Forestry, you know, all of these different, you know, we have, we've got EPA at, here at the table, um, are really gonna have to put together all the little pieces as fast as possible. So I would urge people to look at SB 1260 and see if it's a good idea. I mean, I know that the state employees can't do much, but the rest of us need to, uh, those of you smart people, yeah, Dave Edelson, help, help us look at that bill and see if it's a good idea or how, how to make it better. Thank you. I'm handing it. I think we had David Edelson next and then Lucy. One, two, six, zero. Yeah. Hey, thanks, David Edelson with the Nature Conservancy. So one concrete thing I think we can do, and Chief Pimelot mentioned it, is to significantly ramp up use of the Good Neighbor Authority. And this is a pretty recent federal authority that allows states to use not only their funding, but also their personnel to advance forest restoration on federal land specifically. And if we look around, it's, we've been looking at what some of the other states are doing, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, they're actually using state personnel to help plan and implement projects both as well as providing funding. And I think there's a lot more opportunity here. We're fortunate in California with the greenhouse gas reduction and other funds that we've got some resources, they're not unlimited. But if what we really wanna do is be as strategic as possible and overcome some of these jurisdictional barriers, uh, I think we, we should roll up our sleeves and look and see are there any legal or policy obstacles to using more state funding and personnel on federal lands. I think there may be some tweaks we can make to enable that, but I think if we're gonna take a landscape scale approach and really try to hone resources wherever they may come from, where they're most needed, then I think ramping up the Good Neighbor Authority is a, a good opportunity. Thanks. Great, thank you. I think I'm Lucy. next. Uh, hi, I'm Lucy Blake from the Northern Sierra Partnership. Uh, I've been coming to your meetings, at these these uh, WIP uh, sessions, and I just want to say that there's been a bit of doom, gloom, and doom, uh, gloom and doom today, but I feel like there's incredible progress going on, and I just want to acknowledge that. I mean, I feel like three years ago when we were talking, we didn't have the Forest Service and the state working as closely together. Um, we didn't, the governor for a long time wasn't really seeing greenhouse gas and forest connection and now really is. That's a huge difference. Um, we've got st the state investing money in, uh, in, in enhancing the health of our, our national forests. So I think that you guys deserve a lot of credit for moving the needle. And I just I really want to say that. And I think also that the work that's being done, uh, Chief Penlot, with, with, private landowners and providing cost share. It may not be enough, but it's it's starting and it does make a difference. I've used some of those programs and I it, it really, really helps people. So I feel like there's a lot of places where the the needle is being moved and it you know we can sit here and beat ourselves, you know, self-flagellation. But it's important to also recognize that there's a lot of good going on. And I just want to give a kudos to um, Ellie uh, at the Tahoe National Forest for the work you're doing. I don't know where you went, Ellie. There you are. Um, for, the, for the work that's happening um, in the French Meadows Project and that whole area, I do think it's a model for what can be done on a much bigger scale. I think we need to get behind those efforts. And it takes somebody like Ellie, who's a creative guy, to be willing to kind of go out on a limb and create a new way of doing business that involves a lot more people than normally are used in, on these projects. So I, I, I'm actually feeling optimistic. I think there's some problems that we're 
Uh, obviously, we, as Ashley said, we need to keep working on getting the money for these projects, but I think we know what to do. And I think there are some um, problems that we still have to solve that are kind of technical problems. And one one I want to bring, bring up, because I bring it up every year, is the biomass problem and the, uh, about what we're going to do with the material. I think we've been thinking about it in terms of these large projects like the Loyalton Mill, which is great to see them coming online. I'm super in favor of that. I've heard more recently about some of these what I would call decentralized biomass uh, that have been used in the woods. And I don't know whether they're any good or whether they really work, but I'm thinking that instead of thinking about bringing all that material from the woods to some other place and having all the trucking costs and greenhouse gas costs associated with that, it'd be interesting to put some technical energy on how you could do biomass on site in like, closed burners that, and maybe there's a need to really upgrade those burners. But I, it's an interesting idea because somehow the idea of bringing all that material to the biomass plant just may not be feasible. And, it, and given the scale and the pace of what we need to do, I just want to throw that out to all the smart minds in this room to be thinking about maybe there is a way to do some of that in a, um, in a decentralized fashion. And we may need to mobilize some people down in, uh, you know, at Caltech or whatever to help us figure out how to do it. Great. Thank you. And thank you for the for the positive comments. The last time, just so you know, the last time Lucy spoke to the Sierra Nevada Conservancy Board, we were huddled in a building with a metal roof in Sierra Valley and an incredible lightning storm. And I think the fact that we came out of that was a sign, Lucy, and it's been like, okay, now we're ready to go. We did that. We made it. We were thinking about how much paperwork we had to fill out if lightning hit the shed, but we got beyond that. So... Um, so great, thank you. Anybody else from the public? Alan? Thank you. Uh, Alan Ergot from the American River Conservancy. My question is directed to Chief Pamela. Um, I am hearing you say that most of the 700 million, more or less, statewide budget is really being spent on that sort of urban interface, of protection of homes, protection of lives. Is, is that <coughs> correct? And if so, <laughs> and if so, then um, my guess is, is that budget is going to have to expand uh, with the impacts of global climate change, high wind events, uh, uh, threats to uh, urban areas. So any, any additional funding that we're seeking for forest management is going to have to be above and beyond that. Is that so the answer to the, answer the second part of your question, absolutely yes. The, the investments in forest management, fire prevention, all of that is, has to happen regardless of how we deal with the fire challenge in California. Um, it goes back to what I said at the beginning about how California decades ago invested in, in its fire protection system. Uh, we, quite frankly, and, and I know we have worked really hard, both RCRC and so many of you in the room, the state, to try to help our federal partners fix their fire funding issue. Uh, we don't have the same challenge they do in the terms of the ability that when, when we exceed what's appropriated in our emergency fund, we have the ability to go back to the legislature and the administration with justification and have them increase that augmentation. Uh, so we continue to work through that and do that. It does not count against our base budget or these other programs uh, that we're trying to implement. Yes, urban interface fires are absolutely a cost driver as part of that uh, 700 million, but I will tell you, we also spent a great deal of effort this year in protecting our commercial forest lands, our private forest lands, things that didn't necessarily involve urban interface, but because, again, of the kinds of fires that we're seeing, uh, it takes a lot of effort and all the tools in the toolbox to try, again, to engage and protect those uh, to minimize the impact. So it's really all of the above, all of these fires are generating more costs. They're more difficult to contain. Also, we're still meeting 95% of our fires are being contained at 10 acres or less on state responsibility area. That's been the state's goal uh, from the beginning. And yes, that does drive to the other side of this coin that it's increasing the fuel buildup. But at the same time, we have obviously 40 million people in the state, many of them in lots of those areas. So we have to maintain a strong response mechanism for state and private lands. But the 5% of the fires that are escaping are getting much bigger. It's taking a lot more effort to contain the fires uh, at, five, at 10 acres or less. So 
This entire system has had to grow to meet that. The state, as Secretary Laird said, has absolutely been behind supporting that. The governor and the legislature have not faltered in providing the resources that we need to do that. But the real challenge, and we're being challenged in the legislature, and we should be, is what are we doing on the front end to try to mitigate that? And so while we continue to prepare for the response, we have got to shift the dialogue. It's everything you talked about today. We need to be investing in the front end to break this cycle, and it's all of these other things. And so that's the commitment. It's what we have to do. Great. Okay, I think at this point we'll let you guys back up to the dais, and thank you again, Ken and Ashley, for being here and your comments. <laughs> <laughs>